As I've always said, murder is a statutory crime. There are elements of the crime that any jury, if it goes to trial, needs to prove. Rashini Rajkumar with you. We're back on Real Talk with Rashini. We're also live on Facebook, live on Twitter, so you can watch us with my next guest. And he is a special guest. I previewed him a little bit in the first hour of the show. We're talking about the events of May 25th that not only changed Minneapolis and Minnesota, but really changed the nation and the world and has after effects that live on. But I am always someone who tries to go by the book and the book is the constitution. And when it comes to the constitution, we're thinking about the law and what's right. And when the law is misapplied to one, that sets a bad precedent that it could be misapplied to many. And that includes you, me, our loved ones, our parents, our children. So it's really important that any crime, any high profile case gets done according to the law. And to get into that, my guest is George Perry. He's a former federal prosecutor out of Philadelphia, retired from that world now. He also used to run Philadelphia's office against police brutality and misconduct. That was in the late 70s and first part of the 80s. So he knows a lot. And George, welcome to Real Talk with Rashini. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you. It's nice to be with you. You know a lot about the law. You've tried a lot of cases from the prosecutorial side. You're now a writer. You do some writing for the American Spectator, for other uh, journals. And I happened to receive your article, didn't know who you were before that day a few weeks ago, from a federal prosecutor in North Dakota who sent this to me. He knows my, I'm a radio host and said, what do you think about this? What are you hearing? And I read that article and I thought, I've got to get a hold of you. And then we talked. Give us your quick overview of your assessment of the George Floyd case, both the charges and that ME's report. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, my, my overall assessment is this. Uh, officer Chauvin has been charged with second degree murder and the other three officers have been charged with aiding and abetting that second degree murder, which means the prosecution must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendants acted with the intention of harming Mr. Floyd and causing his death. And if you start with the, the simple facts of the case, in order to accept this murder theory by the prosecution, you would have to accept that these police officers, against their own self-interest in broad daylight, before civilian witnesses who had cell phone cameras and those same officers were wearing body cameras that were recording their every move and everything that they <clears throat> excuse me everything that they said that under those circumstances they nevertheless sadistically and slowly murdered George Floyd it makes no sense you would have to be stark raving mad to, to engage in that kind of conduct in front of witnesses and knowing that the event is being recorded. And not only does the prosecution have to prove that they intended to kill George Floyd, while they allegedly were then in the act of doing that, they twice summoned medical help to come render aid to their purported victim. Nobody does that. That's, that absolutely negatives any notion of intent to cause harm. So that's just the beginning. That's the, the complete illogical construct that the prosecution has boxed itself into. But when you get into the autopsy findings and the toxicology findings, that's where the prosecution case just totally falls apart. And how so, George? Yes. Well, number one, the autopsy dis determined that there were no life-threatening injuries inflicted on George Floyd. And that includes no life-threatening injuries or serious injuries to his neck or, or larynx. And that, I have to say, that is the crux of this. People see that knee on the neck. In fact, it was the first video we saw, even though in the timeline of events that night, that didn't happen first, it happened later. But yeah. that's the first video people have seen around the world. And that is what it seems in the public narrative Everyone wants to convict Derek Chauvin on, George. Yeah, and, and in fact, there's plenty of video evidence before this encounter gets to that stage. 
And what's so striking about it is in the video that nobody has seen until just recently when the prosecution finally released it, is that- From the police officer body cams. Yeah, that before George Floyd was on the ground being held down by the police <clears throat> and with Officer Chauvin kneeling on the side of his neck. And by the way, that neck restraint by Officer Chauvin is taught to the Minneapolis Police Department. It's part of their training materials. And I cite those materials in, in my articles. Not only is that a fact, which also negatives criminal intent, Mr. Floyd, while he was still upright and mobile, began shouting, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. He shouted that seven times while the police were trying to get him all the way into And that's before anyone was kneeling on his neck or leaning on his back or anything. He was shouting, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Why was he shouting that? Well, now we know from the autopsy report, <coughs> excuse, <coughs> excuse me, we know from the autopsy report that his lungs were filled with edema, which is a frothy, fluid, bubbly buildup. His lungs weighed three times their normal weight. Why did they weigh three times their normal weight? Because they were filled with fluid. And why were they filled with fluid? Because based on the toxicology screen that was performed, they determined that Mr. Floyd had 11 nanograms of fentanyl, a very dangerous and powerful drug, he had 11 nanograms of fentanyl per milliliter of blood. And the medical examiner in reviewing that finding with the prosecutors on May 31, 2020, that is two days after the officers had been charged criminally. <coughs> and let me point, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I'm having a little problem here. <coughs> These police officers were charged criminally before anyone had seen the toxicology results. And is that unusual in your work as a prosecutor? Absolutely unusual. And the toxicology report is central to the whole case. It's, this is an incompetent prosecution. This is, this is an incompetent performance by the authorities. Look, I investigated for five years. I ran a unit in the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office where we investigated and prosecuted the use of deadly force by police officers. We did hundreds of these investigations. And in no instance did we ever make a decision either to prosecute or not prosecute until we had all of the relevant evidence in hand. And the prosecutors didn't do that in this case. They went ahead and they charged these officers before they knew the results of the toxicology. So now, two days after they've charged the police officers, the toxicology report comes in from the NMS labs, which is here in suburban Philadelphia. <clears throat> and let me read to you from a memorandum executed by one of the assistant prosecutors of a meeting, an online meeting with the medical examiner. The, the medical examiner here in Minneapolis. Yes, right. The chief medical examiner, and this is at 7.30 p.m. on May 31, 2020. He begins to review the findings of the toxicology. And he points out that Mr. Floyd had 11 nanograms of fentanyl per milliliter of blood. And he says, according to this memorandum, this level of fentanyl can cause pulmonary edema. That's the frothy buildup of fluid. His, Mr. Floyd's lungs were two to three times their normal weight at autopsy. Yes, because they were filled with fluid. Then the medical examiner says, that is a fatal level of fentanyl under normal circumstances. And then further down in the memorandum, the chief medical examiner said <clears throat> that if Mr. Floyd had been found dead in his home or anywhere else, and there were no other contributing factors, he, the medical examiner, would conclude that it was an overdose death. That is another way of saying that what killed George Floyd what caused him to start shouting, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, while he was still upright and mobile, was a fentanyl overdose, a massive toxic overdose of fentanyl. And by massive toxic overdose, here's what I'm referring to. If you go to, there's a reference section in there, and it points out 
that the fatal level of fentanyl is variable, but has been reported to be as low as three nanograms of fentanyl per milliliter of blood. <clears throat> Excuse me. By that measure, George Floyd had over three times the toxic fatal level of fentanyl in his system. And for those people who may want to argue that, well, Mr. Floyd could have had experience with fentanyl and therefore it would take much more than three milliliters. There's a study out of Florida of 143 fentanyl deaths among people who regularly used fentanyl. And it found that the median fatal overdose among them was 9.8 nanograms per milliliter. In other words, even by that standard, the amount of fentanyl in Mr. Floyd's system exceeded what is lethal. And so if you put all of the facts together, with Mr. Floyd shouting over and over again, seven times, I counted it. He says, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And this is before anybody's kneeling on his neck. And the reason he wound up on the ground, this is quite interesting. When the police were trying to get Mr. Floyd into the squad car. And again, you're looking at their body cam video, which I believe I've looked at all of that. Their yeah. own body cams, very telling which start earlier in that incident on May 25th than that yeah. Facebook video video starts. Yeah, and, and if you look at how they handled this, this is what really struck me, was when they're trying to get Mr. Floyd into the squad car, just, just have him sit in the back of the squad car so they can conduct their investigation. <clears throat> He's shouting out, I'm claustrophobic. Don't put me in there. I'll die in there, man. Don't leave me alone. And what do the police do? Do they hit them over the head? Do they punch them? Do they slap them around? Do they use a taser on them? Do they use mace on them? They do none of those things. Instead, they're saying, hey, if you're, you know, basically you're claustrophobic, we'll roll the window down on the car. We'll turn on the air conditioning. I mean, they were being extraordinarily considerate given the fact that this guy was jumping all around and being noncompliant. And instead of using brute physical force on him in the forms of hitting or striking or anything like that, all they did was pushed and pulled and trying to get him into the car. And then he gets into a verbal loop where he says, I want to lay down. I want to lay down. I'm going to go down. I'm going to go down. And, at and so this, at this point, he might be delirious. I'm talking with George Perry. Yeah. He's a former federal prosecutor out of Philadelphia. He really has no connection to Minnesota, but he started studying the George Floyd case and does not believe any of the officers should be charged with anything. He studied all of the video. He wrote an article. He does a lot of writing. One of those articles in the American Spectator, not only did I read, but well before that, filmmaker... Fleming, Fan Fleming Fannery read it, contacted you, and inspired his new documentary. Fleming made the documentary Murder One, among other movies, a while back. I spoke with Fleming this morning, and he shared with me how he was just so captivated by your article. He needed to reach out to you. He was originally going to do a documentary interviewing, you know, once he knew he was do doing this documentary inspired by your article, interviewing the different attorneys, interviewing Lieutenant Bob Kroll. Instead, he was so moved by your ability to describe this in a very succinct way that you were you became the narrator in this documentary that's coming out in the coming weeks. So I wanted to give people that vantage point as to one of the many reasons I wanted to talk with George Perry today. So this is an exclusive. You are listening to George Perry for the first time on Airwaves. You will see him in this documentary. And and Mr. Uh, Fleming Flannery told me this morning they have not talked about this documentary with anyone yet. So uh, this is truly a WCCO radio exclusive. Before we have to let you go, though, I want to let you know, George, I talked with Earl Gray on Friday. He is the defense attorney, as you know, for Thomas Lane. And Earl Gray says there's new video that he just saw from an incident with George Floyd a year almost to the date prior to this year's incident. Two officers, it was in another city, I believe Chicago, and similar kind of thing. He was pulled over, suspected of a drug deal. They found, found drugs on him. They found money on him. They took him out of the car. He started crying for his mama. A lot of the same things Earl Gray told me that were what he did when he was originally pulled over in this case. He also says in that incident, 
George Floyd followed, uh, swallowed some pills. The officers got him to the hospital. They indeed pumped pills at the hospital out of George Floyd's stomach. So all of those things in that video, Earl Gray is now fighting to get into the evidence for the case against his client, Thomas Lane. He hopes to get those charges dropped. Why don't we get into why you believe these charges should be dropped? I mean, you've said it just doesn't line up with the facts, but what I hope people can understand, I'm a licensed attorney myself, there are elements of a crime that need to be proved by the prosecution. In second degree and third degree murder charges, do you find any of those elements, and I realize they're different, a little different by state, but essentially the same across the country, do you find any of those elements by the actions of those four officers? No, yeah, I mean, it, it all comes down to the cause of death. Those officers did not cause Mr. Floyd's death, period. I mean, everybody talks about, well, you know, they knelt, knelt on his neck, Officer Chauvin knelt on his neck for eight and a half minutes while the man's saying, I can't breathe, and he's calling out for his mother. <clears throat> and And then Mr. Floyd, uh, becomes unconscious and uh, he's, he's no longer moving around. What you are watching is a man dying from a drug overdose. And the police officers who had first called for an ambulance when Mr. Floyd hit his head inside the squad car, they saw that he was deteriorating while he was on the ground. He wound up on the ground because he he kept saying he wanted to lay down, he wanted to lay down. So they said, all right, let's get him out of the squad car and they put him on the ground. And that was when the neck restraint was being used. The officially approved neck restraint was being used to help hold him in place. They had to hold him in place because once he was in custody, they had a legal obligation to prevent him from injuring himself further. And that's what they were doing while they were waiting for the ambulance to come. So while they're doing this, they're noticing that he's continuing to deteriorate. So what do they do? They place another call for an ambulance to step it up, to get there sooner. And as soon as the ambulance gets there, the officers jump up, they load him on a gurney, and Officer Lane gets on board the ambulance and does chest compressions on Mr. Floyd all the way to the hospital. <clears throat> the point here is, there's no evidence of criminal intent. So that's the biggest problem they've got. But equal, well, I shouldn't say the biggest because they got an equally big problem. The cause of death was a drug overdose. And a close, a close second to that is because of the drug overdose, he may have died from excited delirium because he exhibited all of the classic symptoms of excited delirium, his extreme agitation. And then they found at autopsy, he had severe coronary artery disease. He had a history of hypertension. He And he was expressing this ideation that he was going to die. I mean, he started saying that over and over again. All of that is classic for excited delirium. And in fact, what the officers were trying to do was to follow their training on how to deal with someone who's, who may go into excited delirium. Why? Because excited delirium, which is now very prevalent on our streets because of widespread drug abuse, because the drug abuse is part of the excited delirium syndrome, it's very dangerous because it leads to sudden onset cardiac arrhythmia. And in fact, the medical examiner stated that he found that Mr. Floyd had died from cardiac arrhythmia or cardiac arrest, cardiopulmonary arrest. <clears throat> And then he cites something about subdual by police, neck compression, and so forth. So, George Perry, I need to ask you this before we let you go. Yeah. If the cause of death and if, if the finder of fact, should this get to a trial, and currently those trials are set for March, yeah. uh, agrees or finds the cause of death really was what the medical examiner said, then by just sort of process of elimination, you cannot charge those officers with any degree of murder. Is that correct? If, look, the, the issue here is what will the jury determine as to what the cause of death was? The overwhelming physical findings at autopsy, the overwhelming findings of the toxicology screen established that the man died from a drug overdose that either killed him outright 
as the as the fentanyl kicked in or set him up for the excited delirium syndrome, which led to sudden onset cardiac arrhythmia. Those are substantiated to a to a remarkable degree by the physical findings at autopsy and by the findings of the toxicology screen. The rest of this comes down to can they prove criminal intent by these police officers? And I don't see it at all. It makes the murder theory, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> their murder theory makes no sense whatsoever. These police officers, let me say this very clearly for your audience. These police officers did absolutely nothing wrong. Let me repeat that. Absolutely nothing wrong in their handling of this situation. They followed their training. I think they showed a great deal of compassion, actually, in the manner in which they handled Mr. Floyd. He was agitated, incoherent. Out Especially of his if you watch the initial account from yeah. their body cams. And a big yeah. reason why I wanted you to come on today is a reality check. Again, I just am a lover of the law. And I always have said on this show, the moment someone who is truly not guilty is put in jail, then the rest of us are screwed. The, com the Constitution is meant to protect the innocent. And if indeed these officers are, which as I assess that body cam video, I do not find any kind of intent to kill. And after George Perry today, thank you, sir, for explaining this because you come at this and why I'm having you on is you have no horse in this race. You come of it as a lover of the law and the Constitution. You can hear more from George Perry in the new documentary that's coming out, The Death of George Floyd. And coincidentally, just two days ago or just one day ago, uh, the intersection at 38th and Chicago was named for George Floyd. So now it is the George Perry Floyd Jr. intersection. That's what it is called. It was dedicated on the 19th. And... Uh, we will, as the days and months go on, see how this all plays out. Thank you so much, George Perry, for joining us. And the filmmaker has agreed to come on in the coming weeks as that documentary comes out. But I really appreciate your time. People can read George Perry, more of George Perry, and the article that inspired both me and this documentarian to reach out to George Perry at theamericanspectator.com. Thank you so much, sir. Really appreciate your time. Hey, thank you.